Hey guys, what's up? It's Susan with NRSNG. I am going to be talking about chest pain in the emergency department, uh, specific to time management and how in the heck you manage these patients. Um, and for right now, I'm just going to be going over this one patient and the types of things that you need to do and your thought process on how it is that you would um, organize and prioritize your tasks. So the first person we have is a 67 year old male with chest pain for two hours. He has a history of myocardial infarction and two stent placements. The patient describes the pain as a crushing 8 out of 10 pressure. It's located on the left side of his sternum and it radiates down his left arm. He was shoveling snow prior to the onset of the pain and the patient took three sublingual nitroglycerin without relief. So what is the first thing that we want to do on this patient? Without a doubt, the very first thing you want to do is get an EKG. Um, he has a significant history. He has pain in all the right areas. This is something that we're very concerned about. Um, so we want to get him an EKG right away. You get his EKG and it comes back uh, normal sinus rhythm. So there is not uh, and a myocardial infarction uh, that we can tell via ST elevations. So normal sinus rhythm. That's the very first thing you're going to do. The, the very second thing, which is a close second thing, is you're going to get a set of vitals. And I've written those down here, but if you take a peek, the temperature looks okay. Heart rate, it's within normal limits. Uh, the blood pressure is slightly elevated right here. So that could be concerning. It's something that we want to keep in mind just in case it plays a part. Respirations are 16. That's normal. Um, oxygen is 96% on room air. And if you remember back to nursing school, we learned Mona, morphine, oxygen, um, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. So he's already taken the nitroglycerin. So we will take the N part out of that. Um, but we may want to uh, throw him on some oxygen just to help. So the O for oxygen, um, even though he's 96%, he's normal. It's just giving him a little bit extra to, to help him out. Um, and the next thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to place an IV and draw lab work. Now, this will depend on what facility that you work in, but you're probably going to want to draw like a CBC, um, a basic metabolic panel, and a troponin, um, and also probably like your coags and things like that. I'd probably get like your PT, PTT, INR, those kinds of labs. So the other thing is that chest pain patients are going to get a chest x-ray, and what I would do um, if you have somebody who can do the IV for you, you want to delegate that. You want to delegate starting an IV and getting the labs. Um, you need to call radiology and ask them for the, the chest x-ray or CXRs, how it's sometimes um, abbreviated. So you'll call and ask them for a portable down to bedside, and then you have to administer the medications. That's not something you delegate. So like we talked about, the meds are morphine and also aspirin, um, as well as nitroglycerin. And we talked about this. Nitroglycerin is not going to happen this time, so the aspirin. And our morphine dosage is 4 milligrams. That's a general dosage that we start most people off on. So you administer, as soon as the IV is patent or... Um, in and working, you will administer four milligrams of morphine. And then you want to also give, it's four baby aspirin. Um, and that ends up equaling, it. so a baby aspirin is 800, or 81 milligrams, ends up equaling 324 milligrams of aspirin. So you'll give those chewable aspirin to the patient as well as morphine. And because you're giving an IV uh, medication, you want to reassess the pain at 30 minutes. If I were giving um, oral 
pain medication, I would want to do it within an hour. So IV 30, PO one hour. And that's pertinent because we need to make sure to schedule that into our plan of care. What is it that we're going to do? How are we going to be um, making sure that every all the steps are checked off and everything? So you have started with an EKG, you've done vitals, the vital signs are relatively stable, um, slightly high blood pressure, but nothing that's super concerning at this moment. It's not like a crisis at the moment. So you are, you got an IV, your labs have been sent off, the chest x-ray shows up at this time, they take the chest x-ray and you've already given your medications. So the current status for this patient is they are waiting on the results of the blood work the chest x-ray, and then a pain reassessment in 30 minutes. Whoa. <laughs> there we go. Sorry about that. So your chest x-ray results finally, and it's normal. There isn't anything concerning, uh, no enlargement of the heart or anything for them to be concerned on the chest x-ray, it comes back okay. Your blood work comes back um, and electrolytes are all within normal limits, I'll abbreviate that WNL. Um, the blood cell counts, they're all fine, your white blood cells, your red blood cells, your hematocrit, everything is within normal limits for that, but your troponin which we usually call it a trope, your trope is positive, um, meaning that it's elevated. Uh, usually anything below 0 0.1 is considered um, negative. Uh, it's really dependent on the facility and the measurement tools that they use. Uh, so that's why I'm not gonna give you a number here, but um, we're just gonna say that for this facility, it is in fact considered a positive troponin. Um, so, at the point that you receive a positive troponin, you are going to put uh, on your assessment list, very high um, on your assessment list or on your plan list, I should say, uh, another EKG as soon as you possibly can. This may be something you need to delegate depending on what you are in, but if you do delegate this, you need to go lay eyes on that patient. You need to look at them. Um, at a minimum and recheck a vital all of their vital signs as well. So you do retake um, the EKG and it's again normal sinus rhythm. But having a positive troponin means that it's likely they are having a non-STEMI. So this is a non-ST elevated myocardial infarction. So they're still having a myocardial infarction, but the ST wave is um, segment is not elevated. So at this point, this patient's going to be admitted. Um, you're going to probably have uh, in order for the heparin, excuse me, you want to make sure that you have reassessed that pain. If that, if your trope came back uh, before the 30 minutes of reassessment happened, then um, you'll want to reassess it right when you get that trope back. But if not, if you've already reassessed the pain, then that's a good, you want to reassess it within the 30 minutes. Um, and they're likely going to be admitted to the cardiovascular ICU. So before they go to the floor, and this is pretty time sensitive, you need to be starting heparin. So heparin is the big plan that you've got going on here. A couple things about heparin. Um, first of all, uh, this needs to be ran on a pump, um, and you give a bolus of it as well as uh, or a loading dose of it, as well as a continuous IV flow of the heparin. Um, I always, because this is a very high risk medication, I always have a double check with another nurse. Now, one facility I worked at, uh, you couldn't administer it without having another nurse sign off on it. Um, another facility I worked at, it was not as big of a deal. So I think it really depends facility, facility, facility to facility, but I do think that it is um, a good practice to have another nurse verify your heparin before you start it. Um, and before you start your heparin, and this is very important, if the doctor did not 
order the coags, that's vital. You need to make sure your coags have been um, at least ordered and sent off um, before you start the heparin because we need to know what their baseline is prior to heparin administration so we can uh, adjust per nomogram up or down on your um, on your heparin drip. So let's say that they get admitted to the uh, cardiovascular ICU. Now for handoff, um, First of all, I'd like to state that when you reassess his pain, he's now at a 2 out of 10, so his pain has gone down. Um, the EKG, the second one, we said it was a normal sinus rhythm again, so there weren't any changes. You need to make sure the doctor has been informed of that. Um, and then they will be admitted to be monitored and to get their heparin doses right. So let's assume that about six hours later, uh, you get a bed. Um, upstairs. Now, usually the protocol is that every six hours after starting heparin, you get another coag lab draw again. Um, a few things about this. So, first of all, not all ICUs or floors have the same rules, but all ERs are allowed to draw their own blood. So, it is a common courtesy to um, keep the patient and make sure that the blood work is drawn prior to having them be taken to the floor. Um, you will want to at least have it drawn. It doesn't need to be resulted, but you will at least want to have it drawn um, and sent off. Then you'll want to call report. Uh, and then uh, depending on your hospital policies, um, this patient will be transported either by a transporter or um, usually because they're going to the ICU, it needs to be a nurse or at a very minimum, um, a medic or a tech of some sort. So um, they'll want to, you'll have to have them up on a monitor and you will uh, want to make sure that you have double checked your heparin drip at what it's at before you go up. So you call report, you send them up. Now I'm going to switch roles. I've never been an ICU nurse, but, um, you know, I, I talk to a lot of them and I try and, and learn about, you know, what it is that they do on a, a daily basis. But um, you've received this patient and the first thing that I would imagine needs to be done is you need to check a set of vitals. You need to double check, get a baseline for when you first saw that patient. So your eyes are now on the patient and these are the vitals and now we're going to go from there. Um I would also check to see if the uh, APTT has resulted because if it has, you want to adjust the heparin drip uh, as timely as possible. So if between the coax getting drawn down in the ER all the way up for the um, transport up into your room and the time your patient is transferred over, uh, if it has resulted, you'll want to adjust that nomogram. The third thing that I, I do with my um, ICU nurses, and I would assume that the ICU nurse prefers, um, is I confirm the heparin drip rate uh, prior to leaving so that that nurse knows the heparin drip rate is at a specific um, level units per kilogram uh, before leaving. So if that is it, they will adjust the nomogram. You've confirmed the drip rate and you check your IVs. Make sure that they are not red. There's no infiltration. Um, I'd also make sure that there's a second line. If there isn't, there should be, but if there isn't a second line, I would um, request to have a second line placed uh, either by the IV team or by, you know, myself if I was able to do that. I don't know if CVICU is able to do that. The next thing that I would do in my list of things to do is I would do an assessment. Um, head to toe, checking skin, checking their medications that they take at home, um, looking into their history, making sure that um, family members all know where the patient is at, everybody's been updated, those kinds of things. 
Um, and then I would go, I would sit down, I would review all the orders and prepare for any testing. Um, is there anything that needs to be called in? Does the patient need to go anywhere in particular? Uh, and also when the patient comes in, I would, I would get a baseline EKG. And I, I've seen that in almost every ICU I've uh, brought a patient up on, um, is an EKG, whether it's necessarily heart related or not, um, just so they have a baseline. So make sure you get that EKG in there. Uh, and then this is huge. I would monitor that heart rhythm, make sure there aren't any changes in, in anything. Uh, you'll want to assess, you know, has that patient become short of breath? Monitor this, monitor their O2. And why would you think that? Well, we're giving them an anticoagulant medication, um, that could potentially uh, bust off any sort of uh, clot that was happening anywhere and could go to the lungs. It could cause them to come short of breath. Also, you want to check their neuro status because um, it could have gone to their brain. So this is how I would go through and prepare my day. The EKG, of course, is the priority for these patients. And then making sure that your heparin goes in as smoothly as possible and that it's as timely as possible. So I hope that helped with your chest pain patient and doing some time management.